Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our to highlight our most innovative winner for December 2021, Dobson High School. We are very excited to highlight this high school because they have some very innovative things going on at their high school and at the district level to promote FAFSA completion. Um, so today we have with us um, from the district office, Mesa Public Schools, we have Dr. Michael Garcia. We also have counselors here um, from Dobson High School as well. We have Krista Musi and we also have Zach Sumnich. Zach, I hope I didn't mispronounce your last name, which I probably did, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, but we're very excited to have them today chat all about their Cash for College program that they have um, at the high school, again, in district level, and their FAFSA peer coaching program. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to the Mesa team. Thank you very much, Julie, and I'm going to get us started. So as Julie said, I'm Michael Garcia. I serve as the Director of Opportunity and Achievement for Mesa Public Schools, and it is a very proud day to have Dobson here uh, showcase the wonderful things that they're doing as part of our district-wide comprehensive approach to FAFSA completion. And so thank you for joining us on our journey and hearing our story as we promote hashtag cash for college and tell you about our journey to increase FAFSA completion. So um, I'm gonna toss it over to Krista and Zach, and then I'll rejoin you a little bit later on. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thanks um, to, to Julie and to um, Dr. Garcia as well for the opportunity to share with you guys about what we're doing um, at Dobson. I love our school. I've, I've worked at Dobson for, um, I think, 12 years now. And um, we are a school located in the Mesa Public Schools. We're right on the border with um, Chandler and Tempe. And um, we have just under 2,300 students. So we're classified as a large um, high school, uh, but in Mesa, we're, we're technically the smallest enrollment size. Um, and for FAFSA purposes, you know, um, our, I want you guys to know that approximately 70% of our students will are qualified for free or reduced lunch. Um, we have six counselors and um, when we look at the extrapolated data from our feeder junior highs, um, we know that about 70% of our families typically qualify for free or reduced lunch. Officially, um, I think it's about 60% of applications that are actually submitted, um, but that makes a big difference for us when we look at talking about FAFSA initiatives. So moving into some things we do unique to FAFSA, um, we would be remiss if we didn't describe just how we work in general in the counseling process um, in, in our program here at Dobson. So we really focus on creating systemic change. Um, and this is the, the process we work through with most any um, goal or any target or any initiative we have for our students. And we really start by looking at the data and determining what, what do our students need. Um, and we focus on setting some goals and creating some action plans. Um, and throughout the school year, um, most of our time is spent in direct work with students. So you're going to hear us talk a lot about looking at data um, or tracking data. But what we want you guys to know is we do spend most of our time direct contact with students. Um, and each year we continue to refine the process. So I have a quote there, if nothing changes, then nothing changes. Um, so we really look every year and evaluate um, was this effective? How, how can we make it more effective? Um, this worked great. Now what layer can we add or change um, to make it even better or get our results, um, you know, to continue to improve? So why, you know, why is this important? Um, when we look in MESA in general, and we look at um, how our MESA students um, are doing compared to the national average, um, you can see there's quite a big gap there in knowing um, as well the number of students who qualify for free or reduced lunch, FAFSA becomes a really important initiative for our students and helping them attain um, uh, post-secondary success. Um, so we focus on creating a college-going culture um, and creating systemic change. Oops, sorry about that. 
um, and creating systemic change. And we do that in a variety of ways. And one of the things we do that is a little bit unique is we focus our initiatives, um, we assign them as roles and responsibilities to different members of our counseling team. Um, <clears throat> so for example, one of our counselor is responsible for kind of overseeing the implementation of ECAP. Um, one of our counselors is um, over FAFSA peer coaches, one of our counselors over our meta network. Um, and by sort of divvying out those responsibilities, it allows us to really focus on doing an exemplary job with each particular initiative and then coordinating those separate action plans. Um, we do use quite a bit of data and we look at multiple sources. Um, National Student Clearinghouse is something that we've been tracking for years as well as our FAFSA completion numbers. And I'm really proud of the progress. When we started focusing on trying to increase our FAFSA numbers, we only had about a 32% completion rate for our high school. Um, and that was about eight years ago or so. Um, our highest year, we finished just over, I think it was 62%. So we still have a long ways to go. Um, and that's where we're continuing to try to make improvement every year. Um, but it is something that we've continued to see progress and results on with each um, layer of intervention that we have applied. Um, so with FAFSA specifically, looking at our different approaches, we really do a tiered approach. Um, so here are listed some of the universal supports that we do um, with all students. So we start um, speaking specifically about FAFSA. We um, start with junior family meetings the springtime of a student's junior year. And we look at lots of different things in that meeting with the student. But one of the things that we do discuss is talking to our families about FAFSA completion, when the timeline happens, when they're going to need to um, submit FAFSA, and we talk to them about opportunities that the students have um, at the different schools. So things like Arizona Promise or College Attainment Grant or Obama Scholars, um, opportunities out of state as well, QuestBridge. Um, but we start that conversation so families know several months in advance that this is going to happen starting in October. Um, we do do senior meetings as well as follow up with the individual seniors, um, both in August and in January. Of course, we have ECAP lessons and we do a big senior wide application day. Um, we're starting or completing the FAFSA as part of that process. Um, Dr. Garcia will talk a little bit more about some of the district supports that we have. Um, and we have open scholarship and college meetings for all students. So those are things that all of our seniors get. Um, the next level that we started to work is more with targeted groups of students. So um, for example, this year, um, you know, Zach is over this closing the gap action plan, but we looked for gaps. So we noticed that our Latino male students with a GPA of 2.0 to 2.75, um, only, only about 20% of those students completed their FAFSA compared to our senior class average of, um, you know, 55%. And so that's a, a gap right there. And so we designed some specific intervention for that, those targeted students who meet that criteria. Um, other interventions we do with targeted groups of students are with our AVID classrooms. We look at things like class rank or GPA, you know, um, what students in the top 50% of the class haven't um, completed their FAFSA yet. And we also do targeted um, meetings with our college reps or targeted scholarship meetings. So if ASU is coming to campus, maybe the first hour that ASU rep sees every student who is in FAFSA verification. And then maybe the second hour is just a general open meeting for students, to, any student who wants to, to come speak with the rep. Um, so we do a lot of, of groupings and sending passes for students based on sort of those targeted groups. And then our intensive work, um, we have really focused the last few years on working individually with students. The current research demonstrates that students coming from a low socioeconomic background, the most effective strategy is to work with those students one-on-one. -on -one. And we have a system and a process in place that's really easy um, to continue. Uh, we send passes for our students. We work with them during the school day. We focus on um, removing 
any barrier we possibly can. So um, things like we keep stamps in our office. And so if a student has to get a signature page, we we help them address it and mail it from school. So there's not even that step or that process or that barrier of, I have to find where a post office is. I don't know how to mail it. Most of our students don't know how to address an envelope. Um, so those are things that over time we've learned just to remove that barrier completely and show them, you know, it's a great teaching moment too. Uh, I usually say a lot of our students don't know how to address an envelope. I'm gonna address it. Here's the address and we're gonna mail it for you. Um, and so we have just started to really focus on following through one on one with our students. And I think that's where we've started to see a lot of our gains. Um, the big universal supports are things that often many schools have done or we did in the past. And we would see an initial influx of FAFSA submissions right at the beginning, but then it would slowly taper off. And um, what we've noticed trending lately with Dobson is we're behind <laughs> in the beginning, um, but then over time as we continue these individual supports and Zach will talk a little bit more about how our peer coaches function and following up one on one. But as we do that process, we found that we make steady gains all the way through the FAFSA year cycle. So these are just some examples of different data sources that we use at Dobson. Um, specifically, when we meet with our seniors in the fall, we have a senior spreadsheet um, that each alpha counselor completes. And it contains information like where that student is potentially considering applying to schools, um, what their SAT or ACT test score was, um, have they applied, have they completed their FAFSA, um, it also contains a column for scholarship or grants where we're somewhat predicting. Um, so, you know, do we think that potentially that student might be a lumberjack scholar or potentially they might be an Obama scholar? And we put that into our spreadsheet so that we can follow up with them so that when we get our FAFSA finish line data, we can compare and cross um, reference the, the spreadsheets and say, okay, we thought these students were gonna be Obama scholars, it's December, um, half of them haven't done their FAFSA yet and we can run an intervention where we call those students in and work with them and remind them about the opportunity that we need to try to get their FAFSA done or, or they may miss out on that potential opportunity. Um, uh, we also work really closely with our admission representatives. Um, I often say, poor Mr. Tokos at ASU, he's our ASU rep. And, you know, certain times of the year, all of us are meeting with like our Obama scholars and he is getting tons of emails for us from us. But we do work really closely with all of our admissions reps. Um, we try to automate as many processes as possible. Um, so things like sending transcripts, um, we found that when students self-report, they make a, a, a high volume of mistakes. And so we have started training our students to not self-report their grades. And then we automate the sending of the transcripts off of the admit report for them so that their applications are still getting processed quickly, but they're getting processed accurately. Um, so with that, we're going to speak, I'm going to turn it over to Zach to talk to you specifically about our FAFSA Peer Coach Program and sort of how we, we run that program um, out of our office. Um, it, it's a very well-oiled machine um, after a couple of years of implementation that he'll share all those details with you. Sure, thanks, Krista. So the overview is each of the high schools in Mesa um, has four FAFSA peer coaches. So with that um, position, the students that we select are senior students that have completed FAFSA. Um, they're given a stipend, so they're a district employee. Um, so within that program, we're looking for a couple things. When we select these students, we're looking for, do they have an open period during the day? So release hour is ideal because then those students can use that release hour to go into our career center and then we'll send call slips for students to go in and see them so they can do their work. Um, also, um, we want to make sure that in selection, we are looking for some other things such as do we have some of the students that are bilingual to be able to work with um, 
our families that, that may need that extra support. Um, we're looking for the activities that these students are um, involved in. So do we have someone that's representing student council? We have someone that's representing fine arts programs such as band, orchestra, dance, um, so that we're um, spread across campus and that these students can um, reach out to um, those, those groups of students that they have uh, close proximity to during the day. Um, some of the other things that, that um, we look for uh, would be students that are high academic achievers as well. There, there are things that in this um, process, it's worked out well for us in getting the best possible candidates that have some open periods during the day so that um, when they fill out their form, which I give them a weekly form that, that designates what hours they are able to um, go into our career center to see students. Um, we have call slips already ready, prepared, the so the students are in there and they've got an influx of five or six students that need help with their FAFSA per day. And I know Krista talked about before, you know, there's um, tiered and there's targeted students that we will focus on, but I also want to reiterate that every student on our campus is getting called in. So while we have these targeted groups that are getting extra supports, every single student is going to be getting call slips. And we cycle through the students that have not yet completed um, based on our dashboard information. Um, so most of them are getting called in multiple times. So they're very aware of this process. And um, over the years, we've been able to iron out some of the, um, some of the kinks so that, um, it, like Chris was saying, it becomes a well-oiled machine. Um, on top of that, we have a former peer coach um, that is now at ASU um, and he comes back on campus. So I believe the, the correct term for their position is a near peer coach that ASU is providing. Um, these students are extremely well-trained, employed by ASU coming back on campus. Um, and and the, the best thing is they've been in the peer coach position. So a couple of things that I have done there is I allow our, our near peer coach coming in from ASU, is, his name's Chris. Since he was a former peer coach here, I allow him to provide a training for our um, current peer coaches. On top of that, district provides training for all our peer coaches as a group. So these students are getting what they need to be able to help um, both students during the school day and then families as well um, during the events that we run. We usually run a FAFSA um, night twice per semester where we have this advertised um, and the students are here. We usually host it in our media center. Um, they're there working with families, helping them complete FAFSA. So the first year that we run that, we um, ran this event, we did see progress in our data, we were able to show growth so that we were the um, number one um, growth school in the state. So that was an immediate return. Um, but the nice things about this is these students that were peer coaches, they're going on to universities and they're able to take this to the next level and, and again, be employed at the university level. Um, they're taking pride in being able to help their you know, campus, help the current students that are here, because as they go through these trainings, they see what an important position that this, this is. And it also allows them to speak to um, admissions interviews about what do you do to strengthen your campus? Well, this position in and of itself is, you know, that answer. They're, they're coming in, they're helping their community, um, creating that college going culture uh, by helping our, our senior students complete FAFSAs. We have some other district initiatives that the students will participate in. We have the uh, drive-through that we host and our peer coaches go and participate in that. And another neat thing that the district has done is that when we run 
these FAFSA events at school um, that are after hours, they are not just advertised for specifically Dobson students, but they're advertised district wide. So we might have students coming in from Skyline, Westwood, um, you know, from Red Mountain, all the other schools um, have these events. So we're bringing in um, anyone that has questions, concerns, may have something that they, they need help with um, in completing that FAFSA. And then Krista talked about this a little bit before as far as our approach and how we see this work. Um, when you see our trend, we have these school-wide initiatives. So we get an initial bump and those typically happen at all of the schools, like our application day. You're giving school day time for these students to go in and complete with the help of university reps. But where we really have excelled is that one-on-one -on -one over time, you see our um, FAFSA completions continue to increase. And it's part of that individual um, help that we provide. So many of these students are um, being called in and we actually have a tracking sheet that, that we hold that is shared with our um, peer coaches and with our ASU near peer coach. So everyone is on the same page with what um, is the next step for the student because it may be that a student has already came in one time and completed an FSA ID. Um, they may need to just have tax documents. They may meet need to um, have help with the signature page. It might be at that completion stage. So we share that communication so that whenever that student is coming in, um, whoever's working with them knows what the next step is going to be. And I'm just going to jump in really quick. And when you're looking at our data, the 2018-2019 school year was the very first year that we started working um, with the FAFSA peer coaches. And you do see um, a decrease in the, the class of 2020 and class of 2021, as I'm sure um, you guys in the audience have seen trending. Um, it's, an, it's a nationwide trend. Um, what I can say is for the class of 2019-2020 school year up until um, spring break, um, when COVID uh, started, we were neck and neck with the previous year, or we were like a 1% ahead. And so that dip you see in the 2020 and the 2021 school year, um, you know, that's a that's a, a nationwide trend that we're seeing. Um, we're really hopeful this year we're surpassing um, where we were last year. And so we we view that as a lot of progress that we're making with the current students. But what I can say is I know that when we look at statistically across the nation, we're still outperforming what we saw, what we see with um, the other schools uh, across the nation that our gap, our drop was significantly less than perhaps what we, we see. And the positive of peer coaches is they communicate with students on the same medium that other students use. So, you know, they might send, they might do Snapchats um, or they might send text messages um, or they communicate through social media in ways that we don't necessarily communicate as adult professionals. And so they were, I believe they've been able to continue to make contact with students through the pandemic, um, perhaps in ways that don't exist um, for, for the adult professionals. All right. So speaking of data, um, just overall, you know, we we initially started to boost our um, FAFSA completion efforts and build off of some of the best practices of our other campuses. You know, all of our high school campuses all had some innovative practices that we've kind of systematized and and shared out with our other um, schools. And part of that was in related to a grant opportunity we initially had through NCAN. Um, to boost our FAFSA completion efforts. And it ended up uh, resulting in Mesa Public Schools getting the national award for the year in, in innovative practices for FAFSA. Um, but the reason we, we wanted to focus on that is, is related to the data as Krista was pointing to. We, in 2018 as a district, 
um, we only had 38% FAFSA completion. And so just in one year of implementing um, a different strategy with FAFSA peer coaches being um, one part of that strategy, uh, we were able to bump up our district average from 38 to 47 percent. And then in 2020, um, even though there was a little bit of a, a letdown, we were hoping to get 55 percent that year as a district, um, hence our strive for 55 um, hashtag there. We did still get 50 percent um, because of the efforts we were making before the pandemic. And um, to be in full disclosure, this last year, 2021, there's not a bar there, but it was only 46 percent. But it's still, you know, representative of uh, how much more difficult it was to have students complete FAFSAs during a pandemic uh, school year, year and a half. Um, so there, there was a little bit of a drop, but we're seeing progress this year, kind of getting back towards that, that 55%, which is our current district goal. So that's, that's where we're headed. And so we do run a district-wide competition. So our high schools are kind of in a friendly competition with each other. Um, and we do publish results weekly using the data that we have at our hands. Uh, we also send out weekly post-secondary data spreadsheets to every high school as part of uh, being part of the uh, Gates grant and, and meta network that our district is, is taking part in. We have some data folks who are helping us with that data, kind of taking a practice that Dobson has been doing for years um, and sharing that practice and type of data with other uh, schools so they can have that data weekly. And we report out not only how schools are doing in FAFSA completion, but how we're doing in college applications and where students are in the scholarship process and where they are with their grades and where just all things college and career readiness for, um, for us to make more informed decisions about how to help students get to that next level in post-secondary. So here you're seeing an example of our challenge score that we share out each week. And right now Dobson is in the lead. They are, they are back in the lead and, and they are co-owners of the trophy last year. They tied with Skyline. It was a, a literal tie in the competition. So um, we do give out a trophy. We do make it a competition and we do kind of have a, a formula for uh, calculating our scores for each school, taking a little bit of it in, in taking a little bit of the concept of equity into um, play as well. We do put 75% of the score to the overall percentage com of completion, which is really, you know, what we're asking our schools to do. We honor growth a little bit, and then we're also put about 10% of that score into other cultural factors to kind of even the playing field from school to school. So that's currently as of January 7th, Dobson's in the lead and they, they hope to continue to maintain that lead, I'm sure. All right, we also support at the district level with FAFSA peer coach training. And so we organize training for all of our FAFSA peer coaches because although training does happen at the school level, we do support um, the professional growth of our FAFSA peer coaches so they can be better at their jobs. And um, here's just kind of a quick outline. We do three per semester. And so the first semester is all about what is your role? What is the FAFSA? And then we start just getting into looking at data and problem solving. So we've got a, a second semester meeting coming up next week. And we're gonna spend that time looking at our data mid semester and start to identify some of those gaps and setting goals based on those gaps, similar to what Zach was talking about. So we actually walk through the students through a data analysis process and have them set goals based on the data. And then that last one I really love because by the time you get to the end of the semester, it's like, what do we do to motivate those that are just unmotivated to complete the FAFSA? And so we have a really good conversation about strategies we can use to convince people it's still a good idea, even though it's late to file your FAFSA. And so that's our training strategy for peer coaches. What's really cool too is now that we've been doing this for a few years, we do have former FAFSA peer coaches that can come back and they actually um, speak and inspire uh, they speak to and inspire our current peer coaches, and uh, they are available as great resources. Some of them have immediately been hired <laughs> by ASU and other college going organizations because of their expertise. And um, it's just been a great experience and a great community to have um, these young folks do such great work. And we really, although they do get paid a little bit, you know, we highlight the fact that they're 
their primary service is a service to the community and they're helping make Mesa a better place by, by taking on this role. And I truly believe that, that that's what drives most of them. All right. So what have we, what have we learned? Um, you know, with, with FAFSA peer coaches being part of our comprehensive plan, we do know that it worked. We, we did see increases across the board. And of, of course, everyone has a hand in this from our career center staff to our counselors, to our school staff, our teachers um, in concert with the, the, our, our peer coaches as well. So I want to acknowledge everybody that has a role in this. Um, and, and thanks to our school counselors who help organize our peer coaches and help them. But we do know that um, this has worked for us, this comprehensive approach. And every high school has shown continuous improvement. Um, we do know that data is critical. So if you're not looking at data, you're not building more systematic ways to look at data, I would highly suggest that. Um, collecting our own data. We have a senior survey, which we're continually revising to collect some really important data about if students are going to college. If not, what are their plans and, and collecting um, data like that as well. We also know that accountability is important and you know, making that friendly competition holds us all accountable to each other, but also you know, just kind of working with our peer coach advisors who work with our peer coaches and having objectives and systems in place for them to be accountable to their role. We also know that there are a lot of peer coach challenges as well. You know, some of them have challenges with their own FAFSAs and, you know, have challenges that we need to help them overcome. And we've worked with them on that respect as well. And then we also acknowledge that we're perfectly imperfect. We're doing our best. Um, and just trying everything possible to help as many students as possible um, reach their goals after high school. So with that, I think we've reached the question portion. Thank you. And thank you so much. This is such great information. And we do have a couple of questions that came through chat. Um, so one is referring to the peer coaching training content. Um, are topics, are there topics you're able to share? Are there national model resources that you can point to? That's a good question. Yeah, so I wish there had been something that existed, but we, we created all of our training and, you know, it is, it is something that's shareable, but it's also something that's really important to be customized to your needs. Um, you know, what we have developed may not work for your district. So, you know, generally our outline is we, we teach our students what their role is, and then we teach them about the FAFSA and help them learn about, you know, how to assist with the FAFSA. And then it's really about looking at your data and developing strategies that are needed in your district based on your data. And so it, they even change from year to year, our own trainings based on our needs. Perfect. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and then we'll address them or you can definitely unmute yourself now as an attendee and then we can get those questions answered as well. Um, so this is a question for Krista. Um, it says, Krista mentioned data or research that shows one-on-one -on -one works better um, with working with students. Is it possible to share any of this data or research that you have? Um, yeah, I believe it came through um, college college board and NCAN um, and it was a couple years ago and it was very specific though to uh, what works with um, low socioeconomic uh, populations. So that is where the one-on-one -on -one became um, more more relevant, right? So it was for a very specific demographic of um, student and family. Um, so it wasn't just globally more effective. Um, but what they were talking about was was specific to um, students in poverty. And I don't have it at the at the top of my head, um, but it really struck home with me at the time that I was reading it because that is um, potentially a large population of Dobson students and families. And so at the time we had been revising a lot of our universal approaches and big events um, you know, application day was something that didn't um, 
start for us until the 2018, 2019 school year, I believe. Um, or maybe it was the year before, it might have been the, the year before, but you know, we were still working on a lot of universal approaches. And so we added as an additional layer, um, how, how do we start to add more intensive supports with students? Um, and we've done that in a variety of ways. The, the roadshow is a great example. That was something we just implemented last year where we partnered with some of our community partners and meta network partners. And we had about 10 representatives come onto campus. Um, and I went around to each alpha counselor with the FAFSA finish line data. And I said, find me right passes for 10 of your students who haven't, or 15 of your students who haven't completed their FAFSA yet based on the, our finish line data, but who on our senior tracker have designated that they intend to go to college. Um, and, and so each counselor went through and wrote names of students and we called in about 100 students over a four hour time period. And I think about 60 of those students came um, and we had just that day alone in that span of four hours, we had 12 submissions, I believe, um, of FAFSA. And then there was a, some follow up and some resources um, that happened over the next week or two to support more of those students in actually completing their FAFSA. Um, and they were, there are all those tricky situations. Um, they're the tricky scenarios. They're the students who, it's not that they don't want to complete their FAFSA, it's that it's really challenging or really difficult and they haven't been able to get um, the support or find the time, it's overwhelming. Um, they have, you know, all these unique situations that are coming up, which is preventing them from completing the FAFSA. Um, so I hope that answered your question, but I am very confident I saw it through NCAN and, and, and or College Board. Um, and I can try to find it. I have our emails listed, but I made, I just realized I made a typo on, on Zach's. There's an H in his name in some nicked. There's an H. So it, in his email address, I didn't put the H in and I didn't know if Dr. Garcia wanted to get a bunch of emails. So I did not include his um, on there. Sorry. We can update that before we send it out to the attendees. So no okay, worries. thank you. <laughs> Um, but just to kind of piggyback off Krista's answers, um, you know, the FAFSA challenge at the state level, as far as, you know, introducing FAFSA initiatives, one-on-one -on -one has definitely been, you know, the most effective method to assist students. Um, as Krista mentioned, you know, students, um, there's tons of challenges with the FAFSA, you know, students have tons of questions or different situations for students. So being able to help them one-on-one -on -one puts the student more at ease. You're able to help them through the process. Um, you know, easier, you're able to help the families easier as well in case they have any questions as far as, you know, why are, why are they asking for this information? How is this going to help my student? Um, so it is really the most effective method. Um, and Dobson has done, and Mesa Public Schools really has done a great job on scaling that one-on-one -on -one effort um, as opposed to just having a workshop where, um, you know, is, is effective, but the one-on-one -on -one is effectively most to actually get that student to complete the application. Um, we have another question um, and it's in regards to the uh, student peer coaches. Um, have there been any challenges in recruiting peer coaches um, since this seems like additional work for students? Um, are they on board with it? Was there any challenges when you started the program as far as recruiting um, them? Yeah, I guess I can answer that because I handle that process at the school. And I'll say from being at the district meetings, every school handles it differently. But um, we've learned some things along the way. So as I look for these students, I want to make sure they're in, in really solid academic standing. So usually I'll run a list of my top 100 seniors and start there with, with where am I going to select. From there, I'm going to also look down the list of which students might be bilingual, which students have release hours already built in their schedule, and then go from there. And I will go through and, and interview the specific students that fall into those categories. And usually out of that, um, there are more students that would be wanting to do the position than would not wanting, be not wanting to do the position um, just because um, it, it's a resume builder, it's a skill builder, they're helping out both their school and community. Um, and, and yet, 
you're seeing that these students are involved in other things. They're involved, you know, some of my students are playing soccer. Some of my students are involved in, you know, the fine arts programs. Um, but that's why I give them the opportunity to let me know their schedule. So they may have a sixth and a seventh hour release. That's the most typical hours. Um, but they don't have to like work every day. They might turn in that sheet um, Monday to our secretary who helps with the passes. And it might say they're available for two hours that week. And then we just use them during those two hours. Um, and they also work in conjunction with our near peer coach from ASU. So they're in our career center at the same time, working on the same things. And he's a little bit more skilled with some of the difficult family situations. So that's really nice to have there as well, because not only can they refer some of those difficult situations to Chris, who's our near peer coach, but it's a training opportunity for them as well. So they're learning alongside someone who's done this now for essentially three years. Perfect, and it's definitely something they can put on their resume, right? It sounds like a lot of the students you're talking about are getting hired by ASU or NAU with financial aid offices. So, um, you know, the more students we can have informed about FAFSA completion, the better. Um, yeah, and if I can, those students okay. that are, are this, the, the peer coaches right now, if they're applying to an honors college, or if they're applying for some of these students that are applying to Ivy League or type that type of school, um, this answers one of their interview questions. It's almost always, what have you done for your school and community? And that was one of the big selling points um, there as well, because not only are you doing it, but it can help you out as well in the future. I just wanted to add that I, I was at the FAFSA drive through volunteering last week and a couple of uh, Zach's uh, Dobson's peer coaches showed up. Uh, they're busy academically and in extracurriculars, but they were there right after their softball practice. They hurried on over and were willing to help and give a give a, you know, give a helping hand to whoever they could. So I can definitely speak to that. It's amazing. Um, we do have another question that came in. So we touched base on this a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, um, but can you go in more detail as far as how you fund the student peer coaches? Yeah, I can talk about that. So um, right now we are in, in a place where we have grant funding. So we started this program because of a grant. Um, that grant did end. It was a one-year grant. And so um, we were able to use the funds to pay stipends um, out of that grant. Um, knowing that we were losing the grant, um, we were applying for other grants and we were applying for other opportunities. And we, we, we were this close to getting the city of Mesa um, to get us a grant right before we won a national prize. So we, we happened to win a national prize that gave us some more grant money. So we are getting close to the end of that grant money. So right now we're kind of stitching together um, plans for grants. And during that time, we also were um, a recipient of the Gates grant in partnership with Tolleson and Phoenix Union District and ASU and Be A Leader Foundation. So when that runs out, you know, we're, we're gonna be looking for the next one. So right now we're kind of living in grant funding um, we do, when we thought we were going to lose the grant completely, though, we did have strategies to start moving some of that funding over into our local funds, um, which we can still do if that day comes. But right now, as long as we have grant funds that are for this purpose, we're going to continue using those grant funds. But I don't think this is something we're going to let go and, and let the funding get in the way of it because it is an effective strategy. Perfect. I if anybody has any other questions, um, oh, we do have some questions here. So um, was there any pushback from families regarding high school students assisting them with the FAFSA, um, you know, sharing information as far as their financial information, tax, that sort of thing? I can take this one. Um, in, in all honesty, no, we, we haven't seen any any pushback, but I think how you structure things can make a big, a big difference. You know, for, first of all, the sharing of any information is voluntary, right? So if a family was concerned about it, um, they don't, they don't need to. Um, and we're, we, we're not like, 
we're telling students these are the this is the required information you need to complete your FAFSA. We can help you schedule appointments. We can schedule appointments with your family. Um, you know, some students choose to bring the the documentation to school, but we're not telling you know we're not telling you to do that necessarily. Um, but we that's you know a family that would be more concerned about it could potentially go to many of these night events. Um, we have partner organizations that I'd be happy to help a family coordinate an appointment with. They can come in and meet with me if they would want. You know, any of our, our universal events have adult staff there, a, a college admission reps are there. Um, so, you know, if a family was to be concerned, we have a variety of resources that don't involve high school students at all. Um, but with that said, the reason that their FAFSAs aren't complete is because the families can't do it on their own or don't know how to do it on their own. And um, or there's a language barrier as well. And in most cases, um, they are so grateful for the help and support, even if it is a student who's perhaps translating for me or a student's walking by and checking on them or saying, here, go to this website. Um, in all honesty, the students and the families typically are so grateful because the reason it's not complete on their own is because they're unable for whatever reason to complete it on their own from home. Um, so in our experience, no, but I think that's also a case where, you know, um, Dr. Garcia can maybe speak on behalf of some of the other high schools and, and perhaps the needs of your school or the demographics of your school might have um, an implication on how you structure or set things up as well. Yeah, I would agree. You know, a lot of the the help that students provide um, involves voluntary information um, that that students can or cannot disclose based on their their family's preferences. Um, but also by being um, employees of the district, they're also subject to any privacy um, policies and 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 that as well. And we make them aware of that. Perfect. Um, well, I guess for our last question, it's any, you know, closing remarks that you have, any advice that you can give any schools or districts who may want to implement um, a model such as yours, you do a lot with data. I think that's, you know, really a component. They always say data never lies, right? So um, that's definitely something there are any, you know, any recommendations you have for a school, like I said, who may want to start a FAFSA peer coach program or where even to look for grant funding for it. Yeah, so so data is huge, uh, and Dobson can probably speak more to that than I can. But you know, one of the things that Dobson did that we kind of took as a district-wide practice was starting a senior survey at the beginning of the year, where you get an interest survey out to students, and and they can tell you what their post-secondary goals are, and based on that, you can determine: Do you plan to go to college? Do you not plan to go to college? And if yes, where do you plan to go? If no, what are your reasons? And that is really valuable data to have because then we can work with students in a small group or individual basis based on the data they self-report. Um, as far as looking for funding, you know, I can tell you we were going to every community organization, the Chamber of Commerce, our Mesa Foundation. We had just get a good proposal together and shop your proposal around. And I, like I said, we were going to get the Mesa Foundation to fund us, but they pulled the money away when they saw we got it from somewhere else. So um, it was just a lot of salesmanship about why this is important. I think just a closing thought I would share with the audience is um, when we when we started to really use use data and track data and it's expanded over the years you know it's a slow it's a slow process and you make improvements every year um, but sometimes uh, you, you know sometimes maybe you you get a little bit of pushback from colleagues or from administration or from you know um, just anyone you're talking to about it where it's you know, we don't have time or doing this or looking at this data takes away time from the important work we're doing. Or, you know, sometimes I hear comments like, uh, not not at our school, but, uh, you know, well, well, we're about, we don't need the data. We're about working with kids. We're spending our time working with kids. And, and so, you know, from my perspective, what we saw and what we experienced was because we looked at the data, we had more time 
and we served our students better. Um, when you're working with hundreds of students like we are at the high school level, um, you you will miss students and in in also your intuition and feelings can be wrong. There's been times where I felt like we're doing really well. And when we compare and reflect at the data, we're not. And so then we need to stop mid year and change our intervention or change our strategy because what we're doing isn't working. And if you if nothing changes, nothing's going to change. And um, and by looking at the data, it actually served our students better. We made sure we didn't miss anybody. We made sure that that senior that I talked to that said they did their FAFSA, well, when I look at the data, ASU doesn't have your FAFSA. So I'm able to intervene and help problem solve and, oh, you did the wrong year of the FAFSA. Um, so the data, you know, having that time and that, that intent um, to really use it and look at it is what has really taken our outcomes for students to the next level. Um, and so it, it definitely changed my perspective of how I work with students. And I know that um, it, it's critical um, to, to helping, helping our students. And I would add one more um, piece to um, the success I would say over the last couple of years has been our partnership with ASU. So I know I saw some university reps, I saw Daniel from NAU um, commenting before. Um, so, so I know there's some of that that's in this meeting, but um, ASU has not only um, you know, been innovative in, in their approach of, oh, we're gonna create a near peer coach and send these near peer coaches who are highly skilled, well-trained to your campus. And ours is coming twice a week for the full day. So we've got someone that's skilled helping our students all day, two days a week. Not only that, but they've contacted us last year um, and ASU was part of the road show, but we've transitioned that event to just a school day event that we call the road show. And ASU is, is bringing their staff members from uh, Access ASU on the campus to do the same thing again this year. So I would say partnerships with um, you know your, your community resources, in our case, it's ASU from that university level has been a, a huge success and it's continued to grow each year. It's continued to evolve. Yeah, I mean, um, piggybacking off of that, the roadshow didn't take counseling time. I organized it um, under my responsibility of, of being part of the Gates grant. And I think actually that's how the near peer coaches are funded is through the Gates grant. But um, I, I was present and helped organize it, but every other counselor continued with their typical day, their typical strategies, because we had those community partners coming in um, to work individually with the students. So, you know, think outside the box, think creatively about what we found is sending our students outside of school doesn't work. Um, so when we talk about removing barriers, it was one of the big barriers we had to remove is telling students to go somewhere else to get support. Um, and so we have moved to offer as many events during the school day as possible here on our campus. Um, and we see a higher re return, a higher success rate with that. Um, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be the counselor or the college advisor doing all the work. Um, you know, use those partnerships. If you normally would send a family to College Depot, organize something with College Depot or, or uh, Mesa Council College or whatever partners you have in the community, um, the, co the college admission reps, um, MCC, those are our local, our local community resources, right? So that's why we're using those names, but think of who are your local community resources and, and schools near your high school have them you know come into your campus um, to support your students um, and so i just encourage you to think creatively about ways to do that as well perfect these are all great tips great best practices that you have shared today um, we can't thank you all enough for taking time out of your day to present this material to us and to all of our attendees for joining today. We thank you. Um, so special shout out to Krista, Zach, and Dr. Garcia for presenting today. And again, congratulations on winning our uh, Arizona FAFSA Challenge Most Innovative Award for December. We're so excited to highlight um, in this webinar all of the great work that you have been doing at the high school level.
level and district level. Um, and we can't wait to, to see um, what you guys have planned for the rest of this year and for years to come. Um, I'm very excited and hopefully some schools will be able to implement these same uh, best practices that you have had such success on your campuses with. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, for the attendees, we will send out a copy of their PowerPoint presentation, um, along with any additional uh, handouts or resources that we chatted about today. And then this recording will also be on the uh, Arizona FAFSA Challenge website uh, for any of your colleagues or those who were unable to attend the live session. Um, so thank you again, and I hope everybody has a, a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you.